Welcome to our evening service. Tonight we're going to be looking at, once again in the book of Ephesians. And if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we want to read verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open the word together. We pray that the Holy Spirit would teach us of yourself. Uh, open our eyes, Lord, that we might see you in the scriptures. And uh, we pray that you would help each of us to apply these truths to our lives. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to be going backwards in our study in Ephesians. Uh, last time we looked at verses 8, 9, and 10, uh, but a few weeks before that we were looking at verses 4, 5, and 6, and as is often the case, I never finished that lesson. Uh, we looked at the seven aspects of the oneness that belongs to uh, every believer in this age, and we only finished uh, the first six of them, so uh, the last one we didn't get to in verse 6, and as I thought about it, I didn't feel right just skipping over a verse, especially one that speaks about our Heavenly Father, so I thought we would uh, go back and uh, cover that information tonight and look at uh, what Paul has to say about our one God and Father of all. So, as we just read, the oneness of our Father is the seventh unifying factor among all believers. And in verses 4 to 6, Paul was listing uh, seven things that every believer shares equally. And one, the last on the list, is the fact that we all share the same one God and Father of all. So, we share one body the body of Christ, the church. We share one spirit, the Holy Spirit. and He convicted us of sin. He regenerated us. He uh, baptized us into the body of Christ. He indwells us. He seals us, and he empowers us. And that is something that is shared by every believer in this age. We have one hope of our calling. Our calling or our position in Christ is shared equally by every believer the moment we're saved. We have one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one faith, one body of doctrine was deli once delivered unto the saints. And we have one baptism, meaning spirit baptism, that places us in the body of Christ. And tonight we want to look at the fact that we have one God and one Heavenly Father. So we're going to look at the Father tonight. And this is uh, the fourth time that... Paul has mentioned the Father in the book of Ephesians, and he does once more uh, in chapter, uh, a little later on as well. So, the Heavenly Father, we don't often uh, think of him in the way that Paul describes him in verse 6, and there are some unique features that, that we just want to meditate upon tonight. In chapter 1, Paul said, Blessed be the Father the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17 of chapter 1, he said, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, might give unto us the wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's the Father's job. In chapter 2, he said, For through him, Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access unto the Father. So every believer as access unto our Heavenly Father. And in chapter 3, Paul mentioned that, he, he says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we see in chapter 4, the final mention, uh, he is the God and Father of every believer. So, we have in this section of oneness, Paul mentions all three persons of the Trinity. There's one Lord, one Lord Jesus, one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
and one God and Father of all. So let's if you have your Bibles there. Look again in verse 6. Paul introduces what the short amount of information, the small amount of information he's going to give us about the Father, and he says, there's one God and one Father of all. So here Paul says, God is the Father of all. Now, we want to be careful, we want to interpret according to the context, and in this context, uh, this term all is used four times, and it always refers to all believers in this particular context. He's not talking about all mankind. God is not the father of all mankind, but God is the father of all believers. This is something that we all share in common. He is the father of every genuinely born-again person. But this concept of God being the father of all is taken to new levels by liberals and uh, those ecumenical uh, folks that that love this verse. They love to read about God is the father of all, and they promote their heresy with this, that what they call the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of mankind. Now that's a lie. It's, it's heretical. It's part of Freemasonry. They teach that. And Unitarians, there are lots of Unitarian churches around here. The New England is kind of the headquarters for the Unitarian church. And this is so very common in those circles that there's God is the father of everybody, and we're all brothers and sisters. And they love this verse because it does say that God is the father of all. And you know, there's another verse they love, one we're familiar with in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, where there Paul said, For ye are all the children of God. And that's a great statement too. And is it true? Well, certainly true in the context there. But the liberals and the ecumenicals and the Freemasons and the Unitarians and others in that camp, they don't read the whole verse. They read what they want to hear. In, in Galatians 3.26, Paul clearly says, For ye are all the children of God. And that would include, in their thinking, all Muslims, all Buddhists, all Shinto, all Hindu, uh, and all Jews, and even atheists. We're all the children of God. He made us all. And you know, now in this political season, we always hear politicians say, we're all God's children. And God is our Father. He's the Father of all of us. And sometimes that we hear that so often, it gets repeated so often, that some folks start to believe it. And I've even heard evangelicals, some, not all, but I've even heard some evangelicals talk as if this were the case. They talk about things that refer to Christians, and they talk about them as if it were true of everybody. And of course, that's disingenuous. It's not being honest with the scriptures. God is not the father of us all. And while liberals might like to quote a portion of Galatians 3.26, which says, For ye are all the children of God, they should go on in that verse, because Paul goes on to say, Ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the part they very carefully leave out. They omit it on purpose. We're children of God only if we have faith in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, John says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the fact that we have to become a son of God means that we're not all sons of God. We're not born as a son of God. We become a son of God as well by faith in Jesus Christ. And if a person doesn't have faith in Christ, he is not a son of God, and God is not his father. God is only the father of the faithful, of those who have genuine, saving faith, trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 23, John says, <clears throat> Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So not everybody has the Father. Those who deny who Jesus is, those who have not received the Lord Jesus as their Savior, they've rejected him, they've denied him, they are not the sons of God, and they don't have the Father. That's what John says very clearly. Whosoever, who, doesn't matter who he is, if he denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. In Ephesians chapter 2, we saw some time ago in verse 19, where Paul said, Ye are the household of faith. And again, in context, he's not talking about all of mankind. Not everybody is part of the household of faith. Where house, he wasn't talking to all the citizens of Ephesus. He was talking to all the saints in Ephesus, clearly in that context. And so it's true that God is the father of all believers. He is the father of all those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. But if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you do have a spiritual father, but it's not God. If you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8, in verse 44, there the Lord Jesus says, and these are his words, not mine, Jesus looked at uh, those religious leaders who rejected him. They didn't believe on Christ. Jesus said to them, Ye are of your father, the devil. Now, those are pretty strong words. But Jesus spoke the truth. Those religious leaders, God was not their father, no matter how religious they claimed to be. The true and living God was not their father. Their real father was the devil, Satan. They had never been born into God's family. And you know, the Lord Jesus said something else very similar to that in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, in verse 38. And there he said, he mentioned two groups. He said, the good seed, in this parable, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, believers. And the tares, that's the phony wheat that bore no fruit, the tares. It looked like wheat, but it, it bore no fruit. The tares, the counterfeit, are called the children of the wicked one. That's how the Lord Jesus describes those who have not put their faith in him. They're children of the devil. They're children of the wicked one, which is another title for Satan or the devil. Now, you'll never hear a politician quoting that verse. You'll never hear a politician say, only some of us are the sons of God or the children of God. Most of you are children of the wicked one. That's not going to win him a lot of votes. But theologically, that's accurate. If you're not born again, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, you're in the wrong family. You're in the family of Satan or the wicked one. And Satan is your God and Father. Now here Paul tells the believers in Ephesus, we have one God and Father, and that's our Heavenly Father. But if those folks that are not saved, Satan is your God, he's the God of this world, and he's your Father. Ye are of your father, the devil, the wicked one. And so these are very strong words. A person can only become a child of God or a son of God through the new birth, by being born into God's family, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And keep in mind, we all started off, we entered into life in the wrong family. We all started off born of the flesh, and that's why we needed to be born again. We needed to have a second birth, a spiritual birth, so we would be born into God's family because we're not automatically. And that requires faith. So before we were saved, Satan was our God and Father. Jesus spoke to a, a religious leader in Israel named Nicodemus. He had all kinds of religion, and he was faithful in his religion, but he wasn't saved. And Jesus said to him, you must 
be born again. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He was well versed, he was well trained in the Old Testament scriptures, but he had never experienced the new birth. He was not saved, he was not born again. Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That's all he was, he was born in the flesh, and he was a fleshly natural man, but he was unsaved, and he needed that which is spirit is spirit. He needed a spiritual rebirth to be born into God's family. And that's the only way we become sons of God. And that's the only way God becomes our heavenly father. He is not our father until that spiritual birth. And yet we hear that common cliche today. It's a slogan almost. We're all children of God. But it's not true. Sadly, it's not true. Most are children of the devil. There's a broad way where most people are that leads to destruction, and there's a narrow way that very few are that know the Lord in a saving way. Now imagine saying something like this in so-called polite company today in our PC environment, that we're not all the children of God. Why, you'd be labeled a bigot in no time, a hate monger. And yet all you're doing is quoting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't recommend that you bring that up at the bubbler at the office. Uh, you're probably going to turn people off to the gospel, but maybe it could come up if you're sharing the gospel with someone who's really interested and wants to understand the new birth. It's helpful to know that he must be born again because he's in the wrong family. God is not his father until he experiences the new birth. Now, that doesn't mean there's no relationship that God has to unsaved people. He does. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, we're told that God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So every human being has been made in God's image. There's some reflection of God in that person's life. But it's shattered by sin. It's distorted. It's like a broken mirror. There's a reflection of that image of God, but it needs to be restored through the new birth. And even after the fall of man, in Genesis chapter 9, it says, For whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So here, God states that even after, this took place after the fall, that God made man in his image, and man is still in the image of God. And that's why murder is such a heinous sin, because you're killing one who is made in the image of God, and God didn't tolerate that. In fact, he instituted the death penalty, capital punishment, for anybody who would have the audacity to extinguish a, a life created in the image of God. So every human being is made in God's image, but they're not sons of God, and he's not their father. In Acts chapter 17, we're told, for we are also his offspring. And there Paul was preaching on Ma's Hill, and he was preaching to these pagans, and he said, for in him, God, we live and move and have our being, as certain as one of your own prophets, uh, your own poets rather said, that we are his offspring. And we are, all mankind, they're part of the offspring of God. You might say his creatures. So every human being is made in God's image, number one, and we are all his creatures. So God is our maker of all mankind, but he's not the father of all mankind. He is only the father of those who have been born into his family. But God is the father of every true believer. And that's a blessing. That's a, a privilege that we have as believers. And that's Paul's point in Ephesians 4, 6. We have one God. We have every, all of us, meaning all believers in this age, there's just one God and Father of us all. 
And because we all share the same father, that means we're family. All believers are family, part of the family of God. We all share that same heavenly father. And this is part of the oneness that Paul is speaking about, the unity that he's describing in verses 4 through 6 in Ephesians chapter 4. And the fact that we all share the same father, we all are in the same family, this truth should have a unifying effect among believers because we are family. And you know, God also gave to every one of us, if we're born again, God has given us an internal witness to the fact that he is our father and that we belong to his family. If you turn to the book of Galatians chapter 4 and look at verses 4, uh, rather verses 5 and 6. Galatians 4 verses 5 and 6. Here Paul says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, because we've been born into his family, we've been adopted into his family, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that Abba, Father is a term, Abba is a term, it's like saying Daddy. It's a, a, a very close term of endearment to God and Father. What a privilege to be a child of God and to be able to say that he's our Father. And here Paul mentions that all believers in this age have received what he calls the adoption of sons. And that means we've been adopted into God's family. First, if a person is saved, first of all, you're born into God's family through the new birth. And that makes you a child of God. But we become a son of God through adoption. And adoption is a little different in the Bible. It's not like in uh, the way we use the term today, when we adopt a, uh, a child, we are taking someone from someone else's family and bringing them into our family. But the adoption in the Bible uh, didn't mean that. The adoption in the Bible was more like a bar mitzvah. And it was a point in a child's life, a young man's life, when he was accepted as a full-grown, mature adult. So he's not a boy anymore, he's a man. And at that point, he is adopted. This was a Roman culture that Paul is describing here, a Roman practice. And at that point in his life, he is accepted into the family with all the privileges and all the responsibilities of adulthood. And so when a person is saved today, we enter into God's family in two different ways. One, we enter in through the new birth and we become a child. We enter in as a little child, a babe in Christ. And that emphasizes the fact that we've been born into God's family, we're a child, and we have to grow up and mature over time. And yet, at the very same time, positionally, we are adopted, when the moment a person is saved today, he's adopted into God's family, and he's adopted as a full-grown son. In other words, when we get saved, we are brought into the family of God, and we have all of the blessings. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings already. We have them all. And we have all the gifts that we're going to have. Now, they may need to be developed, but God entrusts us the moment we're saved in a very high position, and we are sons of God, adult sons of God, and God treats us not like he treated Israel under the law as children, but he treats us as adults, and he gives us liberty in Christ. And so this is, uh, this is a, a distinction between the two kinds of uh, processes where by a person enters into the family of God today. So we're a child of God, we're a child of God through the new birth, and we are a full-grown son of God through being adopted into his family. 
But either way, God is our Father. He's our God and our Father. So this adoption is a great privilege, and it's wonderful to be born again into God's family. And notice also in this passage, in Galatians, Paul says, because we are sons, because we've been adopted as sons, God gave us the Holy Spirit whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So because we're in God's family, God gave us his spirit, and his spirit lives in us, and one of the most natural instincts of the spirit in a regenerated child or son of God is to cry out and to recognize that God is our Father and call him Abba, Father. It's an awareness that we've been made alive, we've been born, we're alive unto God, and God is now, for the very first time, the moment we're saved, he is now our Father. And Paul says something very similar in Romans chapter 8, in verse 15. He says, ye have received the spirit of adoption. There's that adoption as, as full-grown sons. He says, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So when we're saved, God gives us his Holy Spirit. And his spirit lives us in us, and his spirit bears witness is a witness that we belong to God. We're, his, we're one of his sons, one of his children. And our own human spirit also bears witness to that same fact. So there is in us, in God's Holy Spirit, and our human spirit, two that bear witness to our new life. And being alive unto God is something that a believer knows. You instinctively know when you have life. Now, we can get confused theologically and mixed up with someone who might tell you you can lose it. But there is something deep down inside that bears witness to us that we are the sons of God, that we are the children of God, and it's just the most natural thing in the world to cry out to God, Abba, Father. And the terminology that Paul uses in verse 6 is significant, too, in Ephesians 4, verse 6. He's the Father. That's a unique term. That's a very special term. It speaks of a close and a lasting relationship. It's a father-son relationship. It speaks of a union. It speaks of a connection. It speaks of love. It speaks of lots of things. And it also speaks of, our ne of the necessity of us as his sons to submit to our father, to obey our father. It also speaks of our father as... A father is someone who is, by nature, older and wiser. And God is the Ancient of Days. He's much older than we are, and infinitely wiser. His understanding is infinite, we read in the book of Psalms. So this is the seventh and the final unifying factor that we find in verses 4 through 6. This one is found in verse 6. And this is something that every believer in this age shares in common. God is our God and Father. And notice in verse 6, it's one God and Father. So he's God to us, and he's Father to us. Now, as God, God is the Almighty. He's the all-powerful one. He's the ruler. He is the majesty on high. He is the sovereign over the entire universe. But you know, when ancient times and Bible times, pagans had various views of what their gods were like. Some were good, some were bad. And in paganism, uh, their gods were often impersonal and not necessarily kind or compassionate or even good. Some of their gods were evil. And even today, the pagan concept of God continues in the modern world. The force be with you. Have you ever heard that? God is just some impersonal force out there in the distant universe. And that's the way he is to many unbelievers. That God, maybe he exists, but he's 
far away and he's just some force, some power. But that's not what God is to us. And here Paul makes it very clear that our God, yes, he is the Almighty One. Yes, he is the ruler of all, but he's also a father. He's not a cold, impersonal, distant force way out in the universe somewhere. He is a close and a personal and a loving father to every one of us. So he's both God, the Almighty, and Father, the one who loves us and has a lasting relationship with us. And so that puts our Heavenly Father in a very different place than the concept of deity in, in much of the pagan world. And aren't you glad that, that our God is not just a power, but that he's also a person, a close, related person in union with us? And this expression, God and Father, speaks of the relationship, not only that we have to God, but also the Lord Jesus Christ. And that might strike some as odd, that, that if Jesus is God, how come he calls God his God and his Father? And yet we see this repeatedly in the scriptures. In Ephesians 1, 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God and Father of the second person in the Trinity. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, with, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. He's the Father of the Lord Jesus. He's the God of the Lord Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, it says, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forevermore. Romans 15, 6 says, That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's God and Father of Christ. And then even in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, it says, Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, and there it says, and his Father. So we are kings and priests unto God his, and his Father, meaning the Father of Jesus Christ. And of course that speaks of Christ in his humanity. Just as Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, he was always the Son of God. That speaks of a relationship. That speaks of his person. The Sonship of Jesus Christ speaks of his deity. And because Jesus is the eternal Son, God is the eternal Father. He has always been the Father. And Jesus referred to him uh, so often in the scriptures as my Father but he also referred to him as his God. And even on the cross, when he was dying, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And right after his resurrection, he, he met with Mary, and he says, touch me not, for I am not ascended to my Father, but go to the brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So here the Lord Jesus, as a man, who was also God, the God-man, he said, I'm ascending to my Father, and he's also your Father. I'm ascending to my God, and he's your God. Now the cults love this passage too. They love to uh, point out that Jesus said that, that the God of the Bible was his God. So Jesus couldn't be God if God is his God. And he said that God was his father. And so the father exists before the son, right? In human terms, yes, but not with God. The persons of the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal. But the cults love this, and they seem to ignore the fact that Jesus here was speaking as a man. And as a man, he called God 62 times his Father. But God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's also 
has a very special relationship to every born-again person in this age. He is our Father. And because of this fact, because of this privilege that he's our Father and we are his child, this should humble us. It should cause us to be thankful and to, and to be obedient because he's our Father. And you know, in Psalm 68 and verse 5, there the psalmist refers to the Lord and he says, He is a father of the fatherless. So the term that God is our father was intended to teach us something about the relationship that we can have to, to him, to God. And it's there's something similar to the relationship between an earthly father and his son and our heavenly father and us. It's that close relationship. It's that unity. And here we're told in Psalm 68 that God is a father of the fatherless. You know, there may be some believers who have no earthly father. Maybe they died or they never knew him for one reason or another. And to that believer, God becomes your father. And he fills in the gap and he fills it in quite well. God is the father of the fatherless. And he delights in ministering to people in that way. So here we read that there's one God and father of all. And then also back in Ephesians 4, 6, it says, who is above all. So God is the father of all and he's above all. Now, Yes, it's true, he's above all of the universe. He's the creator, he's the sovereign Lord of it all. But again, the all here means, as it does all throughout this context, it means all believers. That's what Paul is speaking about. So the Father is above all believers, all of his children, in the very same way that an earthly father is above, he's the authority figure above and over all of his earthly children. And there to obey him. And so we have a couple of different relationships here between us as believers and, and the different persons in the Godhead. One is a head-body relationship. Jesus Christ is the head of the body, and we're members of that body. So that's a very close relationship, the relationship between a head and its body. And here's another relationship. God is our Father. And we are his sons, our children. And that also is a very close relationship. And they both speak, whether it's headship or father, they speak of a relationship, a close relationship, but also of authority over. And so God is the father of all, and he's above all. He's over us all. He has authority over all of his children as God and as Lord. We're all part of that same family. And being members of that same family and having the same father, it should have a unifying effect on the church. If we assemble together, when we ever get, are able to get back to assembling together, but when we assemble together as a body, it is a family reunion. It is believers getting back together. It's as brethren, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the fact that we all have the very same father and that we're in the very same family, that should motivate us or encourage us to walk together in unity because we are one family of God. And this positional unity that we have as the family of God part of the universal body of Christ, it should have a practical effect on the unity in the local church setting. Because that's where we live, really, in the local church setting. We're family. And if we are family, we should treat one another as family. We should love one another as family. And we pray together, we pray corporately, and we say, Our Father. Because he's the father of all of us. He's not the father of the whole world. But when believers get together, or when Jesus taught his believing disciples to pray, he said, you men can pray, our father. And we can pray that way as well. He is above us all. 
is over us as our God, as our Lord, and our Father. And notice also here in verse 6, Paul says that he is through all. So he's the Father of all, he's above all, and he's also through all. And I take this word through in the sense of, uh, in an instrumental sense, that God works through us to accomplish his purpose. And God works through every single child in the body of Christ, every one of his children that have been genuinely born again. Now we know that God can use all kinds of instruments, not just his children. We read, in the book of Romans that that all things work together for good and God works through all things all circumstances of life all details of life God can use anything to accomplish his will and his purpose and sometimes God even uses unsaved men pagan men unbelieving men to accomplish his purpose and I'd just like to read a few verses from the book of Ezra about King Cyrus, the king of Persia. Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it into writing. So here, God, the true and living God, was stirring up the heart of this unbelieving pagan Persian king. And it says, to make a proclamation, and the proclamation said, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord Jehovah, that special title, the Lord, all caps, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Now imagine that. Here's a pagan king, and God moved him and gave him a position of authority over many kingdoms in that region, and he charged him to build the temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. It goes on to say, Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Israel, Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold and goods and beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. Now this is the king of Persia, where Iran is today. I doubt if any leader of Iran today is likely to send out a proclamation and say, I want everybody in the region to send gold and silver and anything that the Jews need to help them rebuild their temple. That's not going to happen. But it happened back then in history. And God used this pagan king, doesn't say he was a believer, but he acknowledged that there was a God in, in, in Judah and God used this king to protect the Jews, his people, to bring them back into the land safely, to provide anything that they needed to help them rebuild the temple. Now, that's an amazing thing. God uses all kinds of instruments. And I can't help but think that the Lord is using President Trump today. Not that he's a believer, he certainly hasn't exhibited the lifestyle of a believer, but he does seem very interested in protecting Christians in a hostile environment in today's world in, in the United States. And he does seem interested in protecting our liberties and our freedoms. And so God does seem to be using this man, whether wittingly or unwittingly, and he has surrounded him with some men that are born again. So what God is doing, we don't know, but God is infinitely wise. So God can work providentially and sovereignly through the most unlikely of instruments. 
But in Ephesians 4 and verse 6, when it says God is through all, here he's speaking in particular of believers. And this is a unique way that God is working through us. So how does God work through us? Well, there are lots of ways in the New Testament. I could share a few of them. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, here Paul says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what the Father does. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. So the Father comforts us in our times of trouble and tribulation and testings. And it says that the purpose, why does God comfort us in our tribulation? So that we might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort with, with we ourselves are comforted of God. So God comforts us that we might be an instrument that he can use to comfort others, many others. So God works through us as we exhort and encourage one another through the simple fellowship that we have together. God also works through us. He uses us as an instrument when we share the gospel. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 18, Paul said to, to the Corinthians, he said, God did beseech you by us. Now, that's an interesting expression. He says that God was speaking to the Corinthians through or by the instrument of, by means of, the apostles. When the apostles preached the gospel, it was God speaking through them. They were simply his mouthpieces. And God said to them, be ye reconciled to God. That was the message that God communicated through those instruments. Yes, God uses us as instruments in all kinds of ways. And God wants to use you to communicate the gospel. And as we do, we can be sure that God is working through us. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So God was working in Paul as Paul was serving the Lord. And that little word in or n has an instrumental meaning here that Paul was, that God rather was using Paul as his instrument. As Paul was serving the Lord, God was working through Paul to accomplish that goal, that good aim, according to God's good pleasure. And Paul writes the same thing or something very similar in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 where he says, For it is God which worketh in you or through you. You're an instrument that God uses to accomplish his will. It's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So as we serve the Lord and accomplish his will, it's really God working in us to accomplish that. That's quite a thought. So as we walk worthy of our high calling, we can know that, that God is working in and through us to accomplish his will. Now, we don't see it. We don't see God. We don't feel his power in us. But as we share the gospel with someone, we can know that's what God says. He's beseeching others by means of us. Or as we minister to the saints, it's really the Father working through us to accomplish his good pleasure of ministering to the saints. So God is the Father of all. He's above all of us as believers, and he works through all of us. He works through every believer. The simplest saint, the new babe in Christ, the one that's been saved for many years, God works through all believers. And we see also he says, and in you all. Now that's an unusual expression too. We don't often think of the Father as being in us. But that's what it says. There's one God, the Father of all, and he's in you all. And again, you all means you all believers. And this is another point of unity. 
This is another thing that every believer shares in common. God is in every one of us. Now, we don't often think of the indwelling presence of the Father. We're much more familiar with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and we're familiar with the indwelling presence of Christ. And that's the emphasis, clearly, in the New Testament. It's Christ and the Holy Spirit empowers uh, that our inner life, that the life of Christ could be manifested through us. But the Bible also says that, that the Father is in us in a special way. And I think this means more than just omnipresence. Because, well, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 16, here Paul says, For ye, believers, are the temple of the living God, and as God hath said, he's talking about God the Father, I will dwell in them and walk in them. So God, and this word dwell means to abide. It's not just omnipresence, but it's an abiding presence of God the Father. And so God is in us. He dwells in us. And he walks in us as we walk with him. And he goes on to say, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he's our God and our Father, and he dwells in us. Turn to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12 and 13. Here John says, No man hath seen God at any time. The Father, the, God is a spirit, can't see the Father. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him, and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. The Father gave us his spirit, and the spirit dwells in us, but the Father also dwells in us. And when we demonstrate the love of God, that family love of God to one another, and we minister to other believers, that's the proof, that's the that's demonstration of the fact that God is in us, when we manifest love, because God is love. And we see also in verse 15 of that same chapter, John says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him. So we are indwelt by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The emphasis, obviously, is on the Spirit and the Son, but the Father is in us as well. And that's good to know that all of God is in all of us. And he seeks to fill us with the fullness of God, meaning the fullness of the Trinity, his indwelling presence and power. And this being the case, this should affect the way we live. It should, if God is in every one of us, and the proof of his indwelling presence is the love that we have, that family love that we have for other believers, then it's going to affect the way we treat other believers. And it should have a unifying effect on the members of the body as well. We're in the same family. We have the same Father, the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same life. And it is great to be able to say that God is our Father. He's my Father. He's your Father. And so we have these truths, seven aspects of the oneness that Paul mentions in this passage in verses 4 through 6. And as we consider all of these uh, ways in which believers are one, this Christian unity that we have, the purpose of it is, especially as we see the context of this portion of the book, it's the practical side of Ephesians. The purpose of this is that we might function as one, because we are one. We're one in the Spirit. We're one body. And now Paul has just listed seven truths concerning the unity that we all share, that we all possess. And the Holy Spirit that lives in us will cause this oneness to ring true 
in the mind and heart of a genuine believer. The Holy Spirit causes our, our salvation, the fact that, that God is our Father, that rings true to us because we have that double witness of the Holy Spirit and our human spirit. And they both bear witness that God is our Father. And the, there is also that inner witness that these unities are true. They're true in your life, in my life, if we're born again, and they're true of every born again believer. And just keep in mind that Paul mentions in verse 3 of Ephesians 4, that we are to endeavor to keep this unity. We're not to make a unity. We don't have to make it. It's already been made. We are one in Christ. But we're to keep the unity that God made in the bond of peace. Our job is to be peacemakers and keep that unity one. And as we walk worthy of our high calling, we'll be able to experience that unity. You know, as we look at local churches today in Christendom, professing churches from all different stripes, it doesn't seem that we're very unified. And we're not. Local churches began dividing some 2,000 years ago. There was a, a moral and doctrinal breakdown, and it's been disintegrating ever since. It hasn't been becoming, it hasn't been increasingly unified, it's been becoming increasingly divided. Not stronger, but weaker over time. Humpty Dumpty is broken. And it isn't going to be put back together again. We're not going to fix all the churches out there. But it can be fixed and it can work in an individual local assembly. If we as members of that body are determined to endeavor to give diligence to keep the unity of the spirit that God made in the bond of peace. And that's something by God's grace we're able to do. And God wants us to experience that, that oneness among believers. Even though the churches are so divided and disjointed today, but in our hearts, we can experience that you, the oneness of the Spirit and the unity of the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean we're denying the earthly realities of divisions among professing believers around the world. We're not denying the realities but rather we're choosing to dwell on our high and heavenly calling, that one hope of our calling. And we acknowledge that the disjointed and fractured and leavened condition of the churches today cannot touch or diminish the oneness and the unity that God created that exists in the universal body of Christ. And just like the Christian who might be imprisoned for his faith, he might be persecuted for being a Christian, he might find himself cast in jail and chained to the wall, and even though he is locked up and imprisoned, he can be free as a bird in his heart. And the same thing is true if he understands his liberty in Christ, he is a free man in Christ. No matter what men do to him, no matter what his earthly condition, he is free in Christ. And the same thing is true with our unity. We can experience that peace and unity among believers on a local level. We can experience it in our heart if we understand these truths, that we really are one. That there is one family of God, one God, one Lord Jesus, one spirit, one body, one hope of our calling. And here we see one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Our Father planned it all. And he'll keep it all together until his purpose for this age has been completed. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the truth of Scripture. We thank you for the revelation of the person of 
our God and Father, our Lord. And Father, help each one of us to appreciate the fact that we have been born into your family, that we are your children, that we've been adopted into your family as full-grown sons. And Father, we pray that this relationship that was so precious to the Lord Jesus as he prayed to his Father, he spoke to his Father uh, daily, moment by moment, Lord, we pray that that relationship uh, might exist in our lives as well, that we would have that closeness to our Heavenly Father, and that you would be glorified through it. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name.